This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and my cat can eat a whole watermelon. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, SinoSplice.com, and has a dog named Newton. In this episode, we are talking about everything you wanted to know about tones, but were afraid to ask. Plus, you'll get a rant and a rave. Our guest interview is with the legendary Dr. David Moser, a Chinese language professor, musician, and Chinese comedy actor whose level of Chinese is best described as epic. Stay tuned for this insightful interview. All this and more. Let's get to it. Johnny, how you doing, man? Hey, Jared. I'm doing pretty good. Are you feeling confident today? I think so. Somewhat confident. You strike me as someone who's very confident, or at least they they project themselves in that way. I generally would assume, yeah, I, I'm guess a more confident guy. Yeah. All right, because today one of the things I want to talk about is how confidence relates to、uh, speaking Chinese, specifically how confidence relates to tones when you're speaking Chinese. Do you feel confident in discussing this subject?、Uh, yeah, fairly confident. Actually, I, I wrote a blog post about this back man, when was that? That was in 2014 on Sinosplice. I included this、uh, this graph. It's one of those ones with four quadrants. The y-axis is confidence. And the x-axis is knowledge. Okay. You know, when you look at it this way, you can imagine situations where you know you're a total beginner, so you're neither confident nor full of knowledge. You know, you're down there in the bottom left quadrant.、Um, there are some cases where someone is, for some reason, really confident, but they just don't have the knowledge or the ability to produce correct tones. So that puts them in the top left, the misinformed quadrant. That's where I feel like I end up more often than not. The curse of the overconfident, eh? <laughs> If you do have a lot of knowledge, but you don't have confidence, and I think this is where someone like me would fall, you end up in this、um, the bottom right quadrant, which is doubt.、Uh, you do have the knowledge, but you're just not confident. And then, obviously, we all want to be in the top right, the mastery quadrant, where you know your stuff and you know that you know it, so you just talk. Before we break these down, I think it might be good to emphasize. Why tones are so important. One of the things I always reference is that Chinese it only has 416 unique sounds, but 98 was it 98 or 99 percent of all Chinese language consists of about、uh, 3,000 characters. So if you just do the math right there, you can see that there's infinite homonyms. And anyone studying Chinese obviously has encountered this. That you know there's characters shi shi shi. You know, and they all have the same pronunciation, but you know they all have different meanings. But now when you attach a tone to it, and we have four different tones in Chinese, now you immediately multiply that 416 by four. So you come up with what、uh, 1,200. I, I actually don't know all these. I don't know all these numbers. It's funny, like you, you giving out these numbers really follows, you know, the exact same framework I was talking about. You're you're confident even if you're not totally sure of your knowledge. Whereas I'm like, <laughs> I don't know about those numbers. I better check those before we put this out there on a podcast. So I, I fall in the you know the bottom right, the doubt quadrant. It's like let's make sure we got those numbers exactly right before we put them out there. So it's one thousand six hundred and sixty four unique sounds. Wait, are you talking about syllables? Yeah, syllables, syllabic sounds. How do you? I can't say that right. Syllabic, syllabic sounds, syllabic units. Yes, four hundred and sixteen. The point is that there's a lot of different homonyms. So,、uh, in the tones, actually help us now differentiate the different meanings, like between a different, you know, similar homonym. The tones, just as far mathematically speaking, you know, from that basis, they are really important. Yeah, you have to have clear distinctions between you know words, or people can't understand what other people are saying. It's everything sounds like a bunch of mumbling. I can mumble for you. Okay, so clearly the challenge for foreigners, you know, because we didn't grow up hearing and speaking Chinese, is to get our speech to follow the same patterns、uh, as native speakers, so that they can be clearly understood. Mastering your tones is quite a challenge for most of us. It's true because in English, and that's our frame of reference for this podcast. You know, we do use tones, but、uh, you know, for English, those tones 
you know, convey an overall meaning of the sentence. You know, even as I'm talking right here, my voice is kind of varying all over the place. And you can't always speak like that in Chinese because you got to use that variance in your tones and to express the meaning of the individual word you're trying to say. Yeah, you're talking about sentence intonation and stress. And Chinese has those things as well. But because you have tones on individual words, it's a much more complex dance you have to play uh, with the inflection and the pitch of your voice. So one of the biggest mistakes I've seen learners make, especially around the elementary or early intermediate range, is they, they kind of come to this conclusion like, you know, tones aren't that important. Chinese people can understand me. If I just speak quickly, then the tones, that you can't really hear them anyway. Like they, they, they get this feeling by listening to native speakers that they just speak quickly and they just kind of skip over the tones. I, I heard one guy be like, yeah, actually a sentence, you just like pick one word and uh, get the tone right on that one and you just kind of fudge the rest. That does not work, people. It doesn't work. It's true that native speakers, you know, slur their speech a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's like a lot of things. You got to learn to walk before you can run. And so, you know, this guy is was trying to run with one leg, you know, it just, it just didn't work. Also, my son, he's in a Chinese dual immersion program, and I've been helping out uh, some of his classmates with their Chinese recently. But, you know, they're just like, zai, zai nali. you know, and I'm like, no, it's nali. They're not just like getting the importance of it. I'm like, you know, guys, you got to really hit that tone just right. Because, you know, later on, he's talking about taking something. He's like, nah, you know, I'm like, you know, is that nah or nah? They weren't totally clear about it. I'm like, if you're actually speaking Chinese to a Chinese person, you know, it may not be really clear about what you're saying. And that's the other thing, too, is that if you've been used to sloughing off tones and not really focusing on it, it can be difficult to now learn to focus on pronouncing it properly because you've learned some bad habits. And it actually starts before tones. Um, some people, they didn't really do a good job learning their pinyin. And so it's like D-U-I-D-I-U, like what's the difference? Like if you didn't learn your pinyin really well and know how to pronounce every single syllable, then when you start trying to add in tones, you got two uncertainties. And that combination is just killer. Like you got to know how to pronounce each syllable and then you can focus on really getting the tone right. And it's not going to come to you right away. It takes a lot of practice, but at least if you know the pinyin's right, you can focus on the tone, and when you're working on that, you're going to be building confidence that you can make that syllable with the correct tone. And that's just a side note for anyone who's listening to this podcast who is maybe a parent or isn't actually studying Chinese. Pinyin is not pronounced the exact same way that the English alphabet is pronounced. It's its own pronunciation. Yeah, so you really got to learn your pinyin. Um, it helps to have a pinyin chart with audio. Any syllable you're not clear on, you just keep hitting it over and over and listening to the audio for that syllable. And then just eliminate all the uncertainty so that you can at least be very confident in your pinyin as you tackle tones. So I think, John, what you're saying is like, hey, learn the pinyin first. And then once you get that pretty solid down, then, yeah, let's, let's hit those tones and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. So that you can kind of isolate the, the variable, like the hard part, and really focus on tones. Okay, so now I've learned pinyin and I'm learning some characters. Um, I'm trying to get my tones right. Where do I go from here? You know, when we've got this quadrant, I'm just on the uninformed level. You know, I just, I don't know what I don't know. I'm not confident in my tones. I don't know much about it. How do I start moving up the scale? All right. So I actually once wrote a, a, a thing on my website about, you know, the stages of learning tones. You know, when you start out, you're just like, what? You're totally bewildered. And then you go through a set of stages. So um, it takes some time to get used to the tones. Um, they are going to be like totally bewildering at first if they're totally foreign. But the first stage is to be able to recognize individual tones, like one syllable. You know, when you hear ma, you know, you know, that's first tone. When you hear ma, you know, that, you know, that's fourth tone. Uh, and that takes time to be able to to recognize individual tones. But once you can do that uh, with a high degree of accuracy, then it's a whole nother ball game to hear like two tones in a row and have to recognize both of those. And it's really a skill. It's not just like, oh yeah, I've, uh, I've done the flashcards for the tone combinations. Like, no, that doesn't work. You have to practice it over and over with lots of different syllables to really build up that skill and to be able to recognize two tones in a row. Um, obviously, recognition um, comes first and then production comes after that. Like if you can hear it, then you're, you're on your way to being able to make it come out of your own mouth. 
So what would you say to someone who can't even hear the tones? And I've run across people like this, like, I just I just can't seem to even comprehend it. I, people say it to me, they give me the ma, 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 ma. But I, they all sound like the same word. They all sound like the same tone. It's just a matter of input. Like, you have to listen to it more. And that varies from person to person. Some people need a lot more input before it starts to click. But if you feel like you're just not getting it, chances are you're just not giving yourself enough input. You're probably being impatient with yourself or maybe you're listening and you're not really paying attention. If your mind is elsewhere while you're listening to it, that's not going to work. You have to have, you know, focused attention on this. And so one one way that I like to do it is have one of these apps, like All Set Learning has an app for this, uh, Pinion Chart, uh, but there are plenty of them. Um, there's also the uh, All Set Learning Pronunciation Wiki, which has an online Pinion Chart. So what you can do is you go to the opinion chart, you pick a tone, and you pick a syllable. You can hear what that syllable sounds like with that tone. And you can change the tone, hear that syllable. And so any syllable you feel like you need more practice on, just keep listening to it over and over and then comparing, like, how is second tone and third tone different? Let me listen to this again for the, you know, the 20th time. You have to go through that. I think, John, right after I had met you the first time on that bus, that fateful bus in Zhongshan Park that one day, I still have happy memories of that day. Anyway, so after we met, uh, I learned about your blog. I read about how you'd written about tonal pairs. And uh, this was a great concept for me because at that stage of my Chinese, yeah, I, I could hear the tones. I could replicate them. But it was like, yeah, putting them together in phrases and sentences was still challenging for me. But you came up with this, this – um, you presented this concept of tonal pairs and that there are some tones that were easier to say next to each other and other ones that were having more difficulty. Yeah, so I've been preaching this concept of tonal pairs for a while. Um, at the time, it was kind of rare. Like most textbooks just covered the, the four main tones and the neutral tone and, and that was it. Like once you know these four tones, you're done. You better make them correctly because you should know them, right? But it really doesn't end there. And tonal pairs is a crucial – uh, way to practice tones and to get accuracy. Nowadays, fortunately, a lot of people have gotten on board. You know, a lot of textbooks do have tonal pairs. A lot of online study programs also emphasize tonal pairs. So the idea is there's four tones and a neutral tone, right? And so these four tones can be combined in how many ways? Uh, uh, you do the math, that's 16. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And it, you add uh, four more for the neutral tone because um, the neutral tone can never start a word. So you only put it at the end. So that's 20. So anyway, you need to practice each of these combinations and get good at every single combination. And it's good to practice using words that are real words. Um, I've seen some programs try to practice tones with nonsense syllables. And it's like, oh, well, if you can, if you can understand them and make them with nonsense syllables, then think how good you would be when they're actual words. And I, I understand the logic, but that's not how the brain works. The brain is hungry for meaningful information. So if you're focused on tone pairs that are actual words that you need to learn, then that's going to work a lot better. You remember them better and you'll make progress faster. So um, when I was doing my master's at East China Normal University in uh, Shanghai, I did an experiment involving tone pairs. For anyone who's done this kind of uh, graduate work, you'll know that an experiment is a ton of work. I had no idea what I was getting into. But fortunately, my advisor was pretty good, and he, he helped me uh, narrow the scope of my experiment. So what I did was I examined three different tonal pairs, 1-1, uh, 2-4, one, one, and 3-2. And it was my hypothesis that these tonal pairs represent different levels of difficulty to learners that are still mastering the tonal pairs. So in my opinion, 1-1 one, one was the easiest so this would be something like chu zhu che. Okay, so that's three in a row. So chu zhu che. Oh, wait, that's not, that's not the easiest word, though. No, it's not the easiest word, but that's one of the first words I learned in China because, you know, you need a taxi, chu zhu che. I can't think of a word right now, but um, for my experiment, I made sure that I had easy words. I got a funny story quick about chu zhu che. You'll like this. I was first came to China. I was living with this Italian guy, and, and he didn't speak any Chinese. But one of the guys... In our apartment, he spoke re like really good Chinese. And when you used to be able to call the Baoan, like, you know, the guard station, and they call a taxi for you. And he's like, he's like, oh, I need to get a taxi. And uh, I'm like, yeah, just pick it up the phone and, and just call for a taxi. Like, I don't know how to say it. And he says, just say, choo choo cha, <laughs> like choo choo cha, like a train. <laughs> he picks up the phone and goes, choo choo cha. And 
the dude sent a taxi. I mean, it was, it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> so, and all he did was just got the tone right. The choo choo choo. And, and, and Balan totally knew what he meant. Nice. So anyway, I, I felt that 1-1 one, one was the easiest. And then 2-4. Hong se. Shi se. Like, you know, up and down. That, because it had this really clear up-down pattern, was a little harder because you have to make sure you go up and down, but um, still fairly easy. And then the hardest one by far, in my humble opinion, is 3-2. Uh, and for Americans, this was especially annoying because you always have to say the word uh, USA, mei guo. So you have to start low and then go up, mei guo. Almost all of the elementary level American learners would say mei guo. So they go up and then down. So second, third. By far, the most common way to mispronounce it is up and down. Mei guo instead of mei guo. I call this the uh, the three two tone swap. I have another blog post on that. But anyway, for my for my research, I looked at these three types of pairs. the The challenge of the experiment was getting people to say all these words that have the specific tone pair combinations I was looking at without telling them what words I wanted them to use or even having them realize that I'm evaluating their pronunciation. So I had like some some friends, some Chinese teacher friends who would get them to talk about stuff and we would kind of set up the topic and use some uh, pictures in such a way that they would almost definitely use the words that I wanted them to use and then record all that and then evaluate the three specific tone pairs and see how it went. So tones are hard. They can be hard to learn, especially if you, you know, you've grown up never using any tonal language like that. It, it can be challenging to, to learn these. Right. So l- l- let me take it back to the whole topic of confidence. It is hard. And hearing that probably reduces your confidence. But the way to increase your confidence, if you're someone who's not automatically just brash and, you know, I'm just going to talk and people are going to listen to me. You know, if you don't have that kind of attitude, like I didn't have that attitude and Jared does have that attitude. <laughs> um, what you want to do is you want to just be really clear on what the correct tones are. I've, I've had people ask me like, oh, how do you know the tones? Like they think there's some kind of secret. Yeah, the secret is you memorize the tones. When you, when you learn a new word, make sure you know the tones. And that doesn't mean you're going to say it correctly every time, but that's just practice. But if you don't know the tones, you're almost guaranteed to not get it correct. And, uh, you know, some people kind of rely on this feeling they have from like hearing lots of people say it. And that can be useful. Sometimes you can get the tones right when you say them and not even know what the correct tones are. Uh, That's the kind of thing that a native speaker does. But for you to get really far in your studies, it's definitely the best approach to know the tones explicitly for the words you know. And then once you get good at these tone pairs, these tonal pairs, then you can reliably produce the tones correctly, string them together in natural speech, and then you can feel confident that the Chinese coming out of your mouth is intelligible and uh, quickly move into that top right quadrant of mastery. Oh, wait, I probably shouldn't have said quickly. Eventually move into that uh, top right quadrant of mastery. This reminds me of an interview. This is a forthcoming interview I have with Robert Griffiths. He's uh, he was a former consulate general, and his advice was go for 100% accuracy on your tones. That's your goal is 100% accuracy, and go for that because you just won't hit it. <laughs> because, I mean, he kind of says that if, even if you can hit 80%, you're going to sound really good, and you're going to re- earn a lot of respect from the people that you're talking to. They're going to, hey, you sound good. You know, you don't sound like just a normal foreigner who's just kind of sloughing off their tones you know you they can see you're trying and you sound much better just sounds much more natural and normal to you i I think also about the tone thing is that you know when we in english we can hear someone who has a very heavy accent and sometimes that when we hear someone with a heavy accent we assume that they're not fluent in english where that may not be the case at all that person may have been, you know, living among native English speakers for 20 years and they're very fluent and they can understand just about anything you throw at them in English. But because they have an accent, you get that impression that they are not fluent and they can't speak the language well. And it's hard to understand and understand them sometimes. When we slough off our tones and we don't focus on them, we sound like that person in Chinese. We sound less intelligible. It's, it takes a lot more brain power for that Chinese person to understand us. And we're Yeah, when I deal with clients here in Shanghai, um, one of the first things we do is look at their pronunciation. First, the consonants and the vowels, their basic pinyin. Do they pronounce the characters correctly without tones? Because if they don't, that is the number one priority. They have to get that right. If they've got all that right, 
or it's you know mostly right, then yeah, it's tones. You want to get them as close as possible because if you can pronounce these words clearly and correctly, like Jared said, people will automatically think your overall level is higher. And if people assume your overall level is higher, they're going to stop talking down to you, which of course means they might be more difficult to understand because they'll use more difficult vocabulary and grammar, but that's going to help you progress faster. One other thing I want to add, though, to what Jared said uh, just a minute ago about aiming for 100% accuracy on the tones. Yes. Like at first I was like, of course you want to aim for 100% accuracy because I guess I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Doesn't that go without saying? Yeah, you should aim for 100% accuracy. But if you are a bit of a perfectionist, don't let that stop you from talking. Because when you first start speaking Chinese, you're going to have an abysmally low accuracy rate on tones, you know, like 10% or whatever. feels even lower than what it should be you know, randomly, but don't let that stop you. You got to get those out of you. You got to build that skill. And then once your tones are relatively solid, you do have some control. That's when you need to remember just barely good enough is not good enough. You want to aim for a hundred percent and keep working on them long-term. Uh, accurate tones are a long-term endeavor, definitely more than a year, likely more than two years. It's just something that you keep working on. And if you need to move out of that area of doubt. And, you, and so you have a lot of knowledge, but low confidence. Really, man, just get out there and start speaking. Because when you start speaking Chinese to Chinese people, you can say ni hao. And they're like, oh, ni to zhong wan an hao. And you're like, hey, your Chinese is so good. And that's probably the problem. You just need to get out there and speak. People are going to even compliment you. Even if your Chinese is terrible, they're going to out there and compliment you. Now, there's a double-edged sword because, you know, you can kind of start thinking you have delusions of fluency. But keep focusing Increase your knowledge. Get out there speaking. That's going to help you increase your confidence. You're not going to get better at speaking without speaking. Yep. You just got to practice. Remember, you can speak Chinese, but there are a few things you need to do to get there. All right. Now we have a word from our sponsor, which is Mandarin Companion. As you know, Mandarin Companion is the publisher of easy-to-read novels in Chinese, our lowest level Currently uses only 300 basic characters. So if you are looking for something to, that you can actually read in Chinese, get the books. You can go to mandarincompanion.com. And our plug we'll give today is for The Country of the Blind. John, you chose that story. Yeah, so this is a story by H.G. Wells, uh, the guy who wrote War of the Worlds and Time Machine. Uh, it's not a story that a lot of people know, but it's a really cool story. Um, I guess you could say it's sci-fi, but it's not crazy sci-fi. It's a uh, it's simple enough that we can actually tell this story with only 300 characters and a fairly limited vocabulary. It's a great adventure story, a little bit of sci-fi, and there's a plot twist at the very end. Like the last couple sentences, you're like, oh, man, didn't see that don't coming. Tell them, don't tell them that. Well, I know, don't but tell them that. There, there's a plot twist. You're going to like it. Edit this out. No, I can't. I'm not going to edit it out. You don't need spoilers in this podcast. Yeah, do, okay. We hope you already read it and didn't get totally spoiled on this. All right. Now we go to Rants and Raves. John, what do you have for us today, a rant or a rave? All right, I'm just going to be cranky one more week here. Um, I'm going to do another rant. I, uh, For my job at All Set Learning, I manage teachers, and one of the things I do is I collect feedback from our clients, and you know, if teachers are doing something well, I pass that on. If they're not doing something as well, pass that on. Um, I also provide teacher training uh, so that the teachers can be at their best when they're teaching our clients. And one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of the teachers that when they first start working for us is that they have this habit of telling the, the students that they teach, oh, you can call me, you know, Jane, or, oh, call me Tom. And they have an English name. And this just drives me crazy. It's like, can, can you imagine if I was teaching English in, uh, in China and I told all of my students to call me, you know, Xiao Pan or Pan Lao Shi? Like, why would I use a Chinese name when I'm teaching English? And by the same logic, don't use an English name for your teacher when you're teaching Chinese. And some of the teachers are like, oh, but, but my name is hard for foreigners to pronounce. My last name is Xu or Yu, or, you know, it's hard for them to get. It's like, well, all the more reason that they should be practicing it every single time they say your name. And yeah, they'll pronounce it wrong in the beginning. But that's fine. It's Chinese. Let's learn some culture along with, you know, everything else. And that includes calling the teacher Xu Lao Shi or Yu Lao Shi or, or whatever it needs to be, because that's good practice. And the other thing is that names are kind of vocabulary. When you call a teacher Xu Lao Shi, every time you say it, you're cementing in your mind that this name, Xu Xu, is a surname that other Chinese people have as well. Excellent points, John. Okay, I've got a rant today. 
And I'm not going to name names in this, but they've got a book, a popular book, and they've got an app and a website and things like that. And they are mixing simplified and traditional characters together. All right. So I, I have gripes with this. When you're going out to study Chinese, I mean, it's okay. Learn traditional learn simplified. About 90% of all the instruction in Chinese language that's going around the world is, is in simplified. So most people go over that way and that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to do traditional, that's also good, but you're probably going to be in Taiwan or something if you're going to learn traditional. But when you start mixing them together, I have, I have some big issues with that because I think it makes it a little bit harder. You're, you're studying one type of a character and then when you see the simplified version, you're going to be like, hey, what's this? And then you find out, oh, they're the same thing. Uh, I've seen some of these study tools. These are for beginners. And so you're making it double hard for a learner when they're trying to learn essentially two characters to mean the same thing. Be careful about that. Uh, that's just my rant. Uh, I, we shouldn't mix the two. I think it's important, though. There are always going to be some traditional characters that you're going to want to learn if you're simplified, like because they're used all the time, like long, like dragon uh, or guo. That's also uh, you know for country. That's a commonly used one. But but yeah, don't be mixing simplified and traditional characters together in learning materials, especially for beginner students. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, th there's some like pop-up tools and stuff. Like you put the mouse over a character and it shows you the character again and the pinion. And a lot of them will tell you the traditional and the simplified at the same time. If you're a beginner, you don't need to see the traditional if you're focusing on simplified. Like it's possible to learn them both at the same time, but it slows you down so much. And characters already slow you down so much that just don't do it. And from a very advanced learner's perspective, I can tell you for sure that if you study to a very high level of Chinese, you will eventually learn both of them. It doesn't matter which one you start with. You will eventually want to learn both. And it's easier when you're at a higher level. Also, leave us some reviews. You can find us on iTunes. Write us a review. Give us some feedback about what you like about this show. We'd prefer a five-star rating. Let us know what you think. And also, we want to hear from you guys. Drop us a line. Send us a note if you've got any questions for us. Yeah, if there's any topic we hit that you wish we had gone like in another direction or elaborated more on a point, we're happy to revisit old topics. Getting your feedback and you know your questions really helps us. Now, John, our interview today, this guy's kind of a big deal. Tell us just a little bit about him and why he's so important. Okay, so you're talking about Dr. David Moser. He's been in China for a very long time. I don't want to just repeat stuff that he says, but you know, he's been on Chinese TV quite a bit. He's been a performer in Chinese. I met him, man, how many years ago? About 10 years ago, when he was working for uh, CET as the director, the academic director of the study abroad program. And uh, just talking to this guy, I, I learned so much. He just knows so much about Chinese uh, the language, the culture, and his level is just so high. And it's refreshing to hear his uh, his attitude on learning Chinese. Like you might think with someone who has Chinese that good, he will never make mistakes, but he freely admits that he still makes mistakes, even though his Chinese is amazing. And he's the author of that popular seminal paper. What is it called? Why Chinese is so hard? Why Chinese is so damn hard. That's right. Yeah, so if anyone's running across it, that's this guy, David Moser. So he's the man. You're going to want to listen to this interview. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and do read that article. It may sound like just complaining, but it's kind of like a like a love letter if you if you kind of read between the lines. A love letter to Chinese? Yeah. In English? It's a love-hate relationship, man. You got to admit it. So today I'm joined by Dr. David Moser. Well, you've done all kinds of stuff in China. Could you give us a little sum up of some of the things you've done? Okay, sure. There's some things I probably can't tell you, but I'll tell the ones that are suitable for a podcast. So I first came to China in 1987. And I was at Peking University and working on a translation of a book and spent the rest of the 90s in academia working at the Beijing Foreign Studies University, then worked for CCTV for a while. What did you do a, there? I was in channel, the education channel doing hosting and translating and also some English language programming. And then uh, I worked for about 10 years at a study abroad program called CET that some people might have heard of. And now I'm back at Peking University full circle, teaching at a high class sort of master's program called the Yanjing Academy. And your PhD is in? My PhD is in philosophy and linguistics. Cool. So I went to the two most 
abstract pro <laughs> subjects I could study, yeah. But you've also done comedy in Chinese, mm -hmm. is that right? Right. So like some foreigners, maybe most <laughs> in the 1990s, who had good Chinese and maybe an itch to go on TV, I got involved in this art form called crosstalk, xiangsheng, which is a traditional Chinese verbal art form. Most foreigners kind of did it as a lark. They would go on TV and, and do these skits. I kind of got more serious about it and actually took a crosstalk master named Ding Wang Chan as my teacher. And so I worked with him for many, many years. And I'm in good company because the other famous person who does that is Mark Rosewell, better known as Da Shan. Right, right. You, you guys were studying at the same time, is that right? Yeah, we were at Peking University at the same time. He was he was doing a degree in literature. I, I was translating this book. But yeah, we were sort of there in the same dorm. Dashan Mark is the most famous foreigner who does that, speaks awesome Chinese and probably partly attributable to him going on TV so much and doing these skits for years and years and years. So yeah, that's my basically my story. And I also did music because my original degree was in music. So my other secret life, my secret identity is a bar jazz pianist. I played with jazz groups and it started way back in the early 90s when jazz came back to China because it was in China in the 30s in Shanghai. And so I've been playing jazz piano with groups, various groups all through the 90s and still do it today. And it's one of the most fun things I do in, in China, in Beijing. Okay. And you're also on another podcast, a very good podcast called Seneca, right? Right. For those listening who want to understand Chinese current events, they should definitely check out Seneca because it's probably the most high quality podcast in terms of content, in terms of guests and quality. And it's hosted by Kaiser Guo and Jeremy Goldcorn. And I'm what was somewhat an intermittent co-host and I still am. I still go on maybe a few times a year. But it, yeah, it's a fantastic podcast, a great resource for people interested in learning about politics, Chinese politics. All right. And you can't tell by his voice, but Dr. David Moser also wrote the foreword for the Chinese Grammar Wiki, which is uh, my project at Allset Learning. So thank you for that. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. I I told you I'd, I've been recommending that online version for years and years and years. And now finally we have a, a print version to add to the huge stack of paper <laughs> books I have in my house. But yeah, it's no, it's great to have it in print because I think the internet's going to crash and, and explode one day and we'll go back to reading books again. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so let's uh, explore one of the things you just talked about. You mentioned that you did crosstalk. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Da Shan... You know, his Chinese got so good. I imagine your Chinese got pretty good at that time as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, do you think that something like that where you're just like, you have to do a lot of memorization, right? Right, right Performance. Right, right. Yeah. Do you think that's really good for your overall Chinese speaking ability? Yeah, it is actually. It doesn't have to be going on TV and doing it. You can memorize a skit and put it on with someone at a party or something like that. And certainly at parties where there's Chinese and foreigners, it's a popular thing to do because it's fun to see how your Chinese it works in a performing situation. Why does it help your Chinese? Because a lot of the things that we learn, you sort of learn them and you sort of have them mentally, but you don't get a chance to say them very much. In real, right. in real life, you may passively remember them and you may be able to retrieve them when you're in a conversation, but you don't really have them at your fingertip. They don't really, you know, zinging coming out of your mouth. It's a conscious effort. Yeah. You have to struggle to retrieve it. The great thing about doing something like crosstalk or, or any kind of a play or skit is that you, you, you memorize the lines, you get to where you can recite them almost as if you were in a real conversation. Obviously, a good play or a good comedy skit should sound like it's improvised, that you're just speaking spontaneously. So in order to get to that stage, you have to memorize the, the lines very well. And so they're very solid in your memory. Otherwise, you can't be up there stuttering all the time trying to remember the lines. And you'll find that when you get to that stage where you have them sort of interiorized, then they become a part of you in a way that they wouldn't normally. And if you learn some lines, they're very idiomatic in the context of the script. When you go back to daily life, you'll find, gee, that thing came to, to my tongue very easily because you've got it, you know, memorized. So you'd use the same lines in your daily life. Sure, yeah. But Doesn't so, that make you kind of sharp-tongued? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably. You know, there are certainly certain situations where you can't be sure that what you're saying is something that, that would be very idiomatic and appropriate, but at least you can say it. And in the Chinese context, sometimes they're very impressed that you can even say anything that complicated. They won't be too picky about whether it makes much sense in the context. Right, yeah. right. It's sort of like a process where you build up a sort of repertoire of things you know you can say. I mean, you know it's right because it, you got it from an actual Chinese script. It may not be the actual, the most, the most used, right? You know, the right word, but it's something that you can put in there. Very often it's, it's just important that you say something. It doesn't have to be brilliant or super appropriate. You just have to keep the conversation going. Sometimes that's some good, a good thing to have. And then the other thing is there was a, 
a Chinese performer, a sort of a teacher who had this method called crazy English. It was very popular in the oh, 90s. Right. A guy I named Li Yang. Yeah. And he was a charlatan. I mean, it was absolutely his, – his method was completely – had no scientific validity to it whatsoever. You were supposed to shout it. Right? Yes, you were supposed to shout it out loud. But actually, that guy had a point. He had a, a little bit of justification for what he was saying. He, he used to say, you know, you have to get your English muscle trained, your, your, inner, your language muscles. And this is what he said you should shout. But that's silly. You don't need to shout. Out. But he is right that there is a sort of a, a muscle you have to exercise, which is even though you know the words, you know the phonemes, you know the tones, but your muscles are doing something very different than they do in English. And so you actually have to practice getting your tongue and your mouth around those vowels and those consonants and say those things. And it is like developing a muscle it's, or it's like learning a gymnastic skill or something like that. I used to think it was kind of silly to see the Beijing Foreign Studies Chinese students standing outside at dawn, you know, before class, just reading English texts out loud. You know, they were reading Shakespeare and Gone with the Wind or whatever it was. And I thought, well, this is, seems so pointless as a rote learning. But actually, I think there's a, a point to that. Just saying those words over and over and over, you get very good at it. You know, one of the things that we foreigners are bad at, the tones, those take a lot of muscular action in your mouth and your throat to make them correct. And the mistake we make with tones is our range is too small. We're saying, you know, there's no, there's no range from a high tone to a very low tone. Yeah. And that takes a little muscle that you don't use in your English that much, you know. But it also right. takes confidence, right? Yeah. Because I remember very clearly if I wanted to really enunciate my tones, mm -hmm. I felt like I was being a little bit clownish. Like Chinese people might laugh at me because I was exaggerating right. their tones. Mm -hmm. But really, they just wish I would enunciate. <laughs> yeah. You think... It's yours is exaggerating because it doesn't sound like you. You think I'm going too far. To a Chinese speaker, if you're doing it right to the appropriate extent, it won't sound funny to them. It will just sound correct. It only <laughs> sounds funny to you. To you, right. right. Is it safe to say that when you were studying uh, Xiangsheng <clears throat> with Ding, His name was Ding Guangquan. He, he passed away last year, a great tragedy, like, because he was the one who put all these, you know, kept all these foreigners on TV. Is it safe to say that he was super strict with your Chinese? Like he wasn't having any tones that were even slightly wobbly or? Um, he would definitely correct you if there was a, a risk of misunderstanding or, or most important, if it interfered with the humor. Because humor is very often about exaggerated, uh, sort of very obvious. You can say clownish or something, but they're just theatrical. It's, you speak theatrically in a different way than you would speak in daily life. But it's just a matter of degree. And, it, you know, exaggerating can help you speak it normally. Like slowing down. Like, like right? you know, a phrase like, need some for sure. Need some for sure. What's wrong with you? Need some for sure. You can say it like that. John, need some for sure. But on stage, if someone is acting, you know, crazy or something, need some for sure. You know, and you're, you're right. exaggerating it, but it's the, the tonal contours are exactly the same. You're just accentuating them. It's just like in English. You say, John, what's wrong? Or I can say, John, what's wrong? It's the same tonal contours. So that's, I think that's another reason why this theatrical thing, learning the dialogues, you know, you learn them with the correct tonal contours and with the emphasis. But then when daily life, you can sort of tune that emphasis according to the, the, the context. So were you listening to recordings of these? Mm. Just like over and over until you internalize them, you would like say them as you were listening to them? If you're studying with a teacher, you're, you're actually just listening to him. You're imitating him. The old way Xiangsheng was studied is you took a master. It was like a trade. You, you studied under him and he, he worked with you and you learned from him. Nowadays, of course, people are too busy to like meet every, every other day and, and work with the master. So we, we sort of use the new way, which is listening to recordings. But the, listening to the recordings, it does help if you really listen to it and try to imitate them perfectly. But I think it's, there's something about recordings because it's so fixed and dead and fossilized. Learning language is still much, much better to do it with a person, with a live person, with a human being. Tapes are okay, recordings, you can get part of the way there. But I think there's something about the emotional and the visceral engagement when you're facing another person trying to communicate them like I'm doing now. And you can see my hand gestures, but the audience can't. There's something different about that than just listening to a tape and trying to imitate those sounds. Yeah, it's kind of like those Chinese university students you saw reading Shakespeare in the morning. They weren't doing that because they thought that was the best way. They were doing that because they couldn't go to the right. United States or yeah, exactly. couldn't go to England or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So is it safe to say that if your teacher wasn't super strict with you, that 
you put a lot of pressure on yourself to really get your Chinese up to a good level so you could actually perform? Well, yeah. I mean, it certainly is quite a motivation to get it right and to get it really, you know, memorized and get it interiorized. If you're just going to show up for class the next day and your teacher wants you to say these things, you've only lo lost face in front of one person, which is your teacher who already knows how bad you are anyway. <laughs> but if you're up on TV or you're on a stage and you've got a thousand people out there and, and you know, you've got to say the next line, you start thinking, gee, I don't want to get up there and make a fool of myself, you know, especially since you're already making a fool of yourself anyway, just by being a foreigner trying to do that. You don't want to make a double fool of yourself by doing it really badly, right? So, yeah, I, th I think that's another sort of motivation. You really, really want to be able to do it. And, you know, the kinds of things you learn, language is just language, right? So you may learn some funny sentences and jokes and things, but really those patterns that we were talking about are the same. They're all there. So you're learning it. And also, in a way, this is something that people don't quite understand. I Sometimes when they're learning a language, they feel like, well, it's not really my language. I don't really feel comfortable in this suit of clothes, you know, so I'm going to express things, but I'm not going to really put myself into it because I, I don't really believe people will take me seriously. But that's kind of the wrong way of looking at it. To be unapologetic about it, when you first start to speak a language, it's like you are play acting. You're acting like a play. You don't really speak this language, but you're trying to, to make it sound like you do. And so in a way, you're playing somebody who speaks Chinese. You may not feel like you really are. But the only way to get there is to, is to just learn the lines. You know, you can call them the patterns, but they're like lines and you learn how to say them. And then once you do it like I've done it, like day after day after day for 30 years, it doesn't feel funny to me anymore because it's part of my my life and my language now. But in the beginning, I remember thinking, gosh, this is so ridiculous. What am I doing? Do they really – are they really going to believe that I can speak these tones and say this foreign language? And, and the thing is, if, if you succeed at a certain level, they don't see it as ludicrous. They just say, oh, you're communicating very well. Yeah, I really identify with that. My partner, Jared, he always makes fun of me for being an introvert. Mm -hmm. But I remember, especially the first couple of years when I came to China – and I was trying really hard to practice Chinese, even though my Chinese was, you know, not great. I found it really helpful to kind of feel like I was playing a role, like like it wasn't really real. Mm -hmm. I was like on some stage or something. I was playing a game. You know, there's this person here and they're perfectly willing to talk to me. And the, the regular me doesn't know that person, wouldn't talk to them. But this version of me mm. would just strike up a conversation. Like I remember this one time I was sharing a table with a nurse. Normally I would never really talk to a girl like that. She might think I was hitting on her or something. I don't know. <laughs> and I was just like, I want to know all about how you became a nurse and you know how long you were in school. And it was just drilling her, like asking right. all of these questions. And it was a nice conversation. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's another aspect of it. In order to get practice playing this role, in a certain way, you have to take a different approach to your environment and sort of get out of your shell and talk to people that you would not normally talk to if it were in an English context. Right. Which means sometimes maybe you have to feign interest. <laughs> but oh, yeah. But the thing is, what you want to do is to get as many diverse kinds of conversational situations under your belt as you can. And the only way you can do that is by you know, striking up conversations. So, yeah, all this points to the fact that, yes, you are kind of play acting. You are becoming a different kind of person and acting in a sort of play. But just as someone who's done this for 30 years, I just can guarantee you that when you do that on a daily basis as part of life for year after year after year, it gradually goes from being a play to becoming – you're a player. You, you are a real participant in a real environment. It's no longer fiction. You can actually make people happy or cry with your words. You know, you're not only playing. It's not even a virtual reality. It is a real reality show. And that happens very, very, very slowly. But I remember learning patterns and things that I would say and I would say, this is so fake. I don't really know what I'm saying. I just learned that. I mean, I don't even know it's the right thing to say. But it's, it's a gradual process, but you have to have faith in yourself. This is the way I do it. I just have to keep it up. You know, as you say, be confident about it, even though you may not feel that way. And so the Xiangsheng kind of accelerated that. How long did you do it? Uh, gee, I started studying it academically. When I first came to Beijing, 88, 89, I sort of discovered it. You know, for people listening, can't imagine how much better it is today in terms of teaching materials and, and the different kinds of language materials out there. I mean, in the 1980s, it was a desert. There was nothing. It was the teaching materials were so boring and formulaic and they were they were just worthless. It just so I was looking for something that was a little bit more real. 
uh, and Xiangsheng was humorous and it was colloquial and, you know, so it was a great way for me to learn. But I think nowadays uh, there are things similar to Xiangsheng and even better now on the net. So there's nothing wrong with just diving into those things and listening to them and then trying to actually say them or just practicing those things. It's so much, so much better now. Did you practice it for years, though? The first time I did it was actually not Xiangsheng, but in a skit. And I think it was 1994. And it was for one of the big uh, party conference meetings of 14th Party Congress. Whoa. I was working with Ho Baolin as a famous crosstalk performer, one of his sons, to do a sort of a skit for TV. Boy, was that ever nerve wracking. I just learned the script by heart. And actually, to tell the truth, there were lines that I was saying I didn't even know the meaning of what I was saying. <laughs> In fact, I remember there was one line I I came out and said it and I didn't even know it was a joke. And I said it and the audience laughed. I said, wait a minute, was that a joke? But just before I gone on, I I said, no, is this being broadcast live? And they said, yeah. I said, oh, my God, how many people? I said, oh, four to five hundred million. (laughs) (laughs) So talk about terrified. And one of the lines that got a laugh was they said, what are you doing here in China? And I said, yo, so I'll do whatever, you know, and they thought that was funny. But I remember that line, and I actually was able to use it in daily life. People would say, what are you doing in China? And they would laugh in the same way that the audience had laughed. That's an example really early of a line that I got from the script that I found I could use it in daily life. And I even do it in the same kind of joking way. And they would go, oh, that's great. Your Chinese is fantastic. So it's just like, I'll do whatever. Yeah. I guess for Chinese people, it's like, that's a quintessential foreign thing. You know, whatever you got, I'll do it. It's well, I like, think it's funny because you're a foreigner, right? Yeah, that's right. It, it wouldn't be funny if a Chinese said it. Just talking about performing using Chinese, but since you're also a jazz musician, I thought it'd be cool to talk a little bit about how jazz is all about improvising and being flexible. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot like speaking a foreign language, right? You have yeah. to... You're kind of making it up as you go along, and there are certain rules, but you can kind of break them. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this because you've had so much experience with both. Yeah, that's pretty insightful, actually. I think there is some similarity there, yeah. Especially at the beginning stages when you're learning both. I guess I should mention if people don't really know that much about jazz, I mean, you're basically improvising on the chord patterns, the chord changes of a tune. And there are certain notes, you have a choice of lots of notes that you can play. Some are more correct than others. But, you know, you have to keep playing and keep up with the music. You can't stop. You have to just keep pushing forward and come up with some kind of coherent, beautiful statement that fits the chord changes, which is like the grammar. In a way, it's like the grammar of the language. Chord changes are like the underlying basis of the music. So it's a very hard thing to do. And that's why it's fun, because it's a challenge. If you're not very good on your instrument, you may play along and then you suddenly get lost or you just make a mistake or you start a phrase and you don't know how to end it. But if you succeed in getting through chorus after chorus, it's this feeling of kind of you're constantly a little off guard, but you're keeping track of the grammar or the underlying chords. I think I've always felt when I speak a language I'm not too familiar with, I can remember it Chinese speaking in the beginning, that you have, uh, did we mention this concept of mental ease? Oh, right. We were talking about it earlier. So you, you have this semantics in your head, you know, and you want to put these into linguistic form. Right. It's like ideas without words. Ideas without yet, without words yet. Right. Right. It's sort of like, you know, improvising. You start out and you're trying to say something and you, you sort of think a little bit ahead of time of a basic structure, but you haven't yet quite filled it in. You may make a few mistakes. You may get somewhere and you realize you kind of painted yourself into a corner, a dead end. So how are you going to get out of it? So you can sort of paraphrase or suppose you get to a point you need a word and to complete the phrase and you don't have the word, you can't remember it. So now you got to kind of take a quick sidestep and like say something else that conveys the same meaning then get back on course again. So it's this constant process. It goes so fast you can't really be fully aware of what you're doing. But really that's the process. It's very similar to kind of trying to keep playing, improvising in music. So if you're just reciting lines in a foreign language, it's kind of like just playing the sheet music for a classical piece, right? Yeah, that's a very perfect analogy, actually. <laughs> that's a brilliant. Yeah, exactly. When you're just memorized lines, you're just seeing how well you can reproduce this already existing, perfect, beautiful phrase. But jazz has a huge risk of failure because you're making up the phrase as you go along. Yeah, but I feel like it's so advanced because... I don't know if you remember, like way back in the day, if you didn't know exactly how to say it and you were only attempting three or four word sentences, Mm -hmm. then you just don't say it. Like I have to be sure I can complete this entire sentence and I can hold it in my mind before I can say it. Right. But then once you get to a certain point, like you were saying, you can just start going 
kind of hoping that you can finish the sentence and trying to string it along mm -hmm. before it just all falls apart. That's right. And it falls apart in the beginning because you're lacking so many things you need to piece those things together. You don't have quite the words you want. You also don't have the patterns you can fall back on. You don't have them mastered yet. You may say gibberish trying to make up your own pattern that doesn't fit. Or even worse, that happens more often, you're just copying an English pattern because you don't know what the Chinese one is and they won't understand what you're saying. That's one of the aspects of language learning. And by the way, this is another good analogy because when a jazz player improvises, they aren't really, to tell the truth, making up new stuff all the time. Actually, they're falling back very often on what we call licks or riffs or things that they've practiced a million times and they can always stick into this particular place. Language is like that too. You have thousands, tens of thousands of little memorized little segments that you can just put in. Mm. If I say a sentence like, well, if I were you, I'd spend a lot more time working on your grammar because in my opinion, that's the only way you're going to get any better. So there's some phrase, if I were you, mm. you better shama, 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 write something, 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 because these are little phrases that you can use in any context and you stick the specific thing that you want to say in the midst of those phrases or embed them in clauses and you go forth. Those are things I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. There's things I've fixed phrases in my mind that I can plug in. And by the way, there are many things I could plug in. There are alternate versions I can plug in. And that's how I can speak relatively fluently in English. I don't do so well in English sometimes, but I can keep going. The same thing is when you're learning Chinese. You have to learn these phrases that are in the language patterns. They're even templates. You can just stick something in. Right. So, so here's, an, here's an example You know, I tell my students. So in English, suppose you're a mother and your kid eats too much candy and gets a stomach ache. He said, mommy, my stomach hurts. And the mother says, you see, that's what you get for eating too much candy. <laughs> now, that's a phrase of the mother. That's what you get for. And then, you know, you can stick anything in there you want. This is a template. Right. So, so that's what you get for not preparing early. That's what you get for not working hard. That's what you get for choosing such a stupid way to do it. So that's what you get for eating too much candy. So that's the template. So how do you say that in Chinese? Well, it turns out there is a way. It's not word for word. No. Very it's similar, is it? No, no. So a Chinese mother will say that the child says, Mama, do the tongue. She says, Shei rang ni turn in with tongue. Shei rang ni. Who asked you or who made you? Made who you, you. Yeah. That's the example of a template. If you have trouble speaking the language, you don't have enough of those patterns and templates that you can use as a sentence builder to build a longer sentence. So one thing is you have to build up not only a vocabulary, but also these chunks of language uh, and yeah. have them at your disposal. But then you also need confidence, right? That's right. So in other words, you need to practice that little template over and over again, just like you'd practice a word. So in other words, if you have to be thinking of the tones and everything, let's see, she, what is that second tone? She, wrong, 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 ni, chur, number door, what's tong, tong? If you're struggling just for the basics, your child will think that you're an idiot. You know, well, how come my mom can't talk? <laughs> but the other thing is only by getting those basic contours can you then put the emotion into it because part of it is the she, wrong, ni, that, that, wrong, ni, she, wrong, ni, chur, number door, tong. So that's the thing you have not only like memorize or being able to understand it, but able to perform it with the muscles and your lungs and everything. It's, it's a performative thing. Yeah. So getting back to the jazz analogy, to get to the point where you can do that with music, you have to do all the, uh, the classical just scales and the chords and yeah. So in other words, you don't have to practice scales. Do, re, mi, do, da, 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 da. You have to practice going, da, da, do, ba, bu, ba, bu, ba. You know, all the phrasing and the different things you can make the emotion come out. It's very your, similar. Your jazzy scales. Yeah. You're <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know how many people do music, but I think the ones that have tried that, and even it's not just jazz, rock and roll or pop music. It's the same kind of thing. I, I think people can intuitively understand what we're talking about if they've played any in music groups or anything. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about translation. You've done a bit of translation in your day. You've done some crazy translation, which most of us will never attempt the <laughs> likes of. Do you think that translation is useful for like a beginner or maybe an intermediate learner in their Chinese studies, like translating from either Chinese to English or English to Chinese? A translation, you know, good translation is a very high developed place in the process. But I think it's it's also good practice even at the very beginning because it doesn't have to be complicated translation. It can just be sentences, words, short phrases and things o only by sort of trying to translate in slow motion because it's not speech in real time. You're not translating in real time. You're looking at something and, and you're thinking hard about how would I 
put this into Chinese. What it does is it focuses you not on just words, but also on the syntax of the sentence, the structure and how it works. For example, you can learn to speak fairly good Chinese and never really pay conscious attention to certain features of the language that are necessary for good translation. So for example, we all know that in Chinese, the adjective phrases, the sets of adjectives to precede a noun are sort of front-loaded. So they come before the noun, but in English, they come after the noun. Right. So, so you're talking about modifying the noun. Right. Exactly. In English, I could say, you remember that man who wore a funny hat and spoke French and uh, knew your sister? Well, he came and talked to me the other day. So that's, you remember that man who, and then there's a bunch of modifiers. And it there. could go on forever. It could go over on a very long time, right? Yeah. Whereas in Chinese, you have to front load it. You say, Now, so... Only by doing lots and lots of translation, you sort of start to realize these regularities. It's a huh. These are different. And it means that, you know, you have more information here. So you need to be able to handle and sometimes process that, all, that information. So that's just one example of something that you may sort of learn a little bit at the beginning. But when you start translating, you'll see extreme examples of this kind of thing. It forces you to think, oh, the Chinese sentence is really different than the English sentence. Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of obvious because, you know, Chinese does it this way and mm -hmm. English always does it this way. But other times, like they kind of both do multiple things, right. but maybe one of them is not as common or one of them is only, you know, when you're angry or I don't know, whatever, right. some special context. Right. right. And so you really have to kind of, we're, we're not talking about when you're having a real conversation, real time. We're talking about, you know, you're studying, there's no time pressure. You're really taking a close look at the language mm -hmm. and only by doing this and spending the time really thinking about, would we really say this in yeah. English? Right. Do you really get this this right. benefit from translation, right? Right. Because because when you're hearing it in real time, you can understand it, but you, you're processing too much information to be able to kind of think about the structure of what you're hearing. You just get all the information, you put it together in a way that makes sense. Whereas if you're doing it in slow motion by translating, then you're actually sort of looking very clearly and closely at every particular element. So by the way, when I first started learning Chinese, I would sometimes just do this as a daily kind of activity when I had nothing else to do. If I'm watching an American, an English language TV show, and they're saying lots of dialogue and some interesting things, I'll just say, now, how would I say that in Chinese? How would I get that across? How would I stress that now? How would I stress that particular aspect of the sentence? And there, there's another thing that I found very helpful, which is sometimes in China, you can find these bilingual editions of books. They call them Dui Zhao. If you're going to ask them the bookstore, some Dui Zhao edition of, let's say, Dickens or could be anything, where on the left side is the Chinese translation and the right side is the English or vice versa, the original on the left and the Chinese on the right. Those are also good practice. It's sort of passive translation. You're not really actually translating, but you're looking at how the translator did it in this particular case. So you're looking, say, okay, here's the sentence in English. Now, how would I express that in Chinese? You can sort of try to think yourself, how do I do that? And then the answer is right there on the page on the right. And you say, ah, oh, so that's how they did it. Okay. So if you keep doing that, you're kind of gradually amassing these ways, the different feeling for the language. We call it yuga, feeling for the for the language. Mm. And you're sort of gradually gaining a sense for how what feels good in English and what feels native and, and natural in Chinese are two different kinds of things. You don't really learn this completely just by going through a grammar book, as good as your grammar wiki is, that's going to only give you the information about how to do it. It doesn't give you the performative skill of doing it. It just gives you the knowledge of what it involves, right? But also in the same way, you're talking about a certain kind of like translation study. Like you don't want to read every book in this way. You don't want no. to turn reading into a translation-based no. activity because there's actually a very good series of graded readers you know, <laughs> that don't have translations because we want you to yes. you know, read the language. Right. I think that's a good point. I think that's a great point. There's different kinds of reading. There's reading and there's reading. Sometimes you're reading in order to learn something to strengthen some aspect. Sometimes you're, you're reading in order to strengthen your speaking. I will sometimes download uh, you know, scripts from a movie and then I'm reading it, not necessarily for pleasure, but reading it just because I want to strengthen my speaking. And then there's there's reading to actually do the reading at the level to actually check how your progress is going on. And also, it's just like swimming. You have to start in the shallow end and you get some basic strokes. So it, it's real swimming, but it's swimming in the shallow end. And then the graded reader will get you up so you're in pretty deep, but you're still able to keep your head above water. So there's different kinds of reading that you do. You know, I agree. There's sometimes a reading I do that are really not for fun. They're really just because I want to strengthen I, actually, something. Actually, I'm, I'm starting to think 
you have a PhD in linguistics. There might be certain kinds of reading that you do and almost no one else does. <laughs> Right in terms yeah. of studying Chinese, you have to have a level of masochism uh, that most people don't have to get to this. But it just depends on you know your dedication, and it's like anything else. You can say I I like lacrosse. You can say I like tennis. But you know if you're not doing some practice where your legs really start to hurt and you'd like to be watching Netflix, but I got to get it in the court, you know, and really really get my chops up to speed, right? There's a point at which you got to like slog through some things. You don't have to do it your whole life. But I mean, the part of learning is is tough. But the point I was going to make that I didn't quite make too well is some of the learning that I would call performative, you have to get so that it's not conscious, that it's done instinctively and reflexively. And that's true of tennis, it's true of swimming, it's true of jazz. You get the skills at first and you're consciously thinking of them and you're saying, yeah, I'm doing, okay, I know what to do here. And you, But you have to do it enough that you get to the point where it's just the natural thing to do and you're not conscious of the rules, you're not conscious of what you're doing. So that's the same of reading. You've got to keep reading, reading lots and lots of text so that it feels second nature to you. And the same thing with speaking, you've got to just keep it up. Graded readers are great because it, it's a good shortcut. It enables you to see Things that without a book, it would take you years before you would get the insight. Oh, my God, yes, the Baja construction is like that because you've garnered it for many years of experience. But if you know in advance, ah, oh, that's what it's like, it still will take you a lot of time to master it. Just saying you know the principle, when you get out and speak in public, you're still going to make all kinds of mistakes to it. There's a conscious awareness of the learning the rules, and then there's a performative aspect where you have to just be able to do it in real time. Right, and, right. Yeah. I think for me, the, the whole translation part of my studies took two distinct forms. One of them was when I was in uh, grad school working on my master's in linguistics in Shanghai. I was a student, so I did some translation work as part-time income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it involved reading the news and not exactly translating, but kind of summarizing mm -hmm. into English. Mm -hmm. I actually always hated reading the news. Mm -hmm. I hated that, you know, after studying Chinese for however many years, <laughs> it was still hard. Mm -hmm. I hated that I had to know all these proper nouns, mm -hmm. you know, to translate stuff. And so I didn't want to read the news, but to make money, I forced myself to do mm -hmm. it. And in the end, I realized it was really useful mm -hmm. because only by going through it and, you know, doing it regularly and then putting it into English that I really start to appreciate those patterns that mm -hmm. appear over and over again in the yeah. news. Yeah. And they really are yeah. quite regular. And so right. after that, it could become more unconscious. So it was around 10 years ago when I was working at Chinese Pod. And, uh, you know, we have all these dialogues. And you have to translate them into English as part of the product. I became acutely aware of how different forms of translation may be more or less effective to the learner. Because, you know, this is right and this is also right. But this one's confusing and this one's not. Mm. Like in English, uh, we can say, today, I'm going to the bank. Or you could say, I'm going to the bank today. One of the sentence orders kind of matches Chinese, you know, with where the time word goes, right. and the other totally doesn't. Doesn't, yeah. And so, you know, there's all these little tricks that you can learn with translation, and I felt like that gave me an extra insight, not only into how to help people learn, mm -hmm. but into some of the things that might have been really tripping me up back in the beginning and even know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think certainly it's an uneven process when you start learning, because some things you may learn very early on but you don't really start to feel them in, until you've done it a long time. Other things are actually, you won't find them in textbooks necessarily. There are things that are sort of more subtle on a larger scale that you, you only learn by just experiencing them and, and doing them over and over and over again. There's no such thing as a complete, total grammar. Grammar is, somebody said, grammar is leak. No matter how they look so perfectly in the books, you're going to always find utterances and don't fit the rules and all this kind of stuff. And people, and even in their native language, will have disfluencies, they call it, you know, where you're not quite speaking fluently and you make a mistake, but you still keep going and people can understand it. And you need to have a sense for that as well. When it breaks down a little bit, oh, it broke down there and so he put in another word or something. And it's very long involved process. It takes a very, very long time. But it, the only way you can do it is by constant listening to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Reading. Reading, yeah. Okay. And then going out and playing some jazz to, to relax. By, by the way, this is just an added thing. You also have to just be realistic about it. You're going to lose face. You're going to say things wrong, no matter how long you, you do it. I was gave a talk tonight and I said several things wrong, the wrong tones and everything. It's a, never, never mind. I, I got it. I communicated. You're always going to lose face. So you just have to accept that the people who are listening do not care. They do not expect you to speak perfect Chinese. 
They don't even expect you to speak beautiful Chinese. They're really more interested in your ideas and what your and your feelings. They're not going to be sitting there criticizing your Chinese, and you know that because we've all heard non-fluent Chinese speakers speaking to us in English. And if the person is intelligent, bright, energetic, engaged with what you're saying, you don't care about the accent. You're just hearing the ideas. That took me a long time to realize that. Because I used to just be utterly ashamed to even try to speak Chinese sometimes. It took me a long time to think, wait a minute, they're saying all these things to me in English and their their pronunciation is wrong, grammar is crazy and everything. But I'm not sitting there laughing at them. I'm saying, no, this is a very smart person. This is a very nice person. So you have to keep that in mind. Speaking is a loss of face, but in the end, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is communication. And that's what you're trying to achieve. Well said. In the end, you can learn Chinese. Yes, <laughs> that's right. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, dungeon master, analysts, Lego master builder, plumber, civil engineer, and that one guy named Mike. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to Mark Zuckerberg. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself. Yep, just me, Jared Turner. I'd like to thank Dr. David Moser and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazda. See you next time.